Module 6, Ethics, Part 1, Lecture 6A, Introduction to Ethics. Introduction to Ethics. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that studies decisions of right and wrong, good and bad, what's proper behavior. Ethics is based on free will. If everything is predetermined, as we talked about in the previous module, then how can we even speak about moral choices? To speak about ethics, let us consider some thought questions and give each of these some serious thought or discussion. Number one, you are taking a philosophy class that requires a five page paper. You are not a good writer, but you need to do well in this class. You know someone you could hire to write an original paper for you for a few hundred dollars. Do you do it? I'll tell you right now that if you try to do it and get caught, you'll fail the class. But the question is, is it unethical to do it? It's clearly in my mind is because passing the class means you did the work and your degree and your grade is based on that. But people are very, very tempted to get away with what they could get away with. Number two, you're a British military commander in India in the 19th century. In India, the custom is to practice sati, the practice of a widow burning herself alive on her husband's funeral pyre. This is part of the religious culture of India. Do you have the right to put a stop to this practice? Historically, Britain really did put a stop to it because they said that this was morally wrong. But is it morally wrong to judge what people do in another culture based on our culture? That's known as cultural relativism, and we will discuss it. Personally, I think that the British military commander made the right choice. But I'll have to tell you, when I've taught this class in the past, many of my students disagree. Number three, someone comes to the door asking to see your father. You know that your father owes this person a lot of money. If you tell this person your father is there, he may harm your father. Do you lie to protect your father? And what if your father is refusing to pay back money he owes? Is lying ever justified? Immanuel Kant will say no, lying's never justified, but this seems to be a case where it is. Number four, you see a bank robbery and the robbers are running out of the bank they drop a large bundle of $100 bills. That's a little bag of money on the right, by the way. There is no one around and no security camera. If you know you will not be caught, would you take them? Many people in my class have said yes. If they get away with it, they would get away with it. Although we have a deep sense that there's something wrong with doing that. And that's one of the questions. Is ethics just what you do if you won't get caught? Or is there something deeper where you do the ethical thing, even if you get away with not doing the ethical thing. Number five, your friend comes to you for advice. His wife has Alzheimer's and is in a nursing home. He loved his wife and will not divorce her, but he also has physical needs. He has a younger girlfriend and wants to move in with her. Should he do it? He wants your advice. The rabbi in me says he should not do it, but I understand why he would be tempted to do it. This has a lot to do with the question of utilitarian versus deontology we'll be studying in the next module. Think about this question. Are people good or bad? To get us started, let's ask the question, what is the nature of human beings? Are people naturally good or bad? Before we can speak about ethical behavior, we first must speak about human nature. Are people by nature good? with a tendency to do the right thing, or people by nature bad with a tendency to be selfish, or perhaps people are torn between both good and bad tendencies. By the way, that's the Jewish teaching. Or perhaps people have no free will at all, and all their behavior is predetermined. To begin, we must go back to Plato and his most famous dialogue, The Republic. The Ring of Gyges. Plato's brother, Glaucon, tells the story of a shepherd named Gyges who found a mysterious ring. He found it in a cave which was revealed by an earthquake. When Gyges put on the ring, he discovered that by adjusting it, he could make himself invisible. 
Being invisible, he now believed he could get away with anything. So Guy just used the ring to break into the castle, seduce the queen, murder the king, take over the kingdom, did whatever he wanted because he was invisible. Glaucon uses the story as a demonstration that if people could get away with it, they would act in a way that's unjust. People would do what they could do. To quote Glaucon, no man could be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand fast in justice. No man would keep his hands off what was not his own when he could safely take what he liked out of the market or go into houses and lie with anyone at his pleasure or kill or release from prison whom he would and in all respects be like a god among men. Again, Gaia, this point of view of Glaucon is if you could get away with it, you would get away with it. According to Glaucon, the ring proves that people are naturally evil. The only thing that prevents them from acting out on that evil is the fear of getting caught. The name of this natural tendency to do evil is psychological egoism. To use David Hume's language, psychological egoism describes an is, how people are, not how they ought to be. It is descriptive, not prescriptive. Human nature is evil and people will behave ethically only out of fear of punishment. Of course, in Plato's dialogue, Socrates on the right disagrees with Glaucon. Socrates taught, knowledge leads to virtue. If people know the right thing, they will do the right thing. People can use their intellect to become good. People want to do the right thing and they can do the right thing by studying good and evil. So who's right? Glaucon or Socrates? The idea of a mysterious ring that gives its owner special powers became one of the great myths of Western literature. Richard Wagner's famous cycle of four operas, Der Ring der Nibelungen, is built on the legend, and more recently J.R.R. Tolkien's great trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, contains a similar theme. For Plato's brother, the legend is proof that people are naturally evil. And a ring proves it. The debate whether people are naturally good or bad has a long history in both religion and philosophy. For example, Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679, top on left, taught that people are naturally bad and life in nature would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. We'll return to Hobbes later in the course. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, bottom on left, taught that People are born good and society corrupts them. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. We'll return to Rousseau later in the course. The same debate was part of the Confucian tradition in the Far East. Mencius, 4th century before the Common Era, upper left, also taught as Mengzi or Menzu, believed that people were basically good, just as water flows naturally downward, so human be behavior goes naturally for the good. Here's the example of somebody rescuing a child who fell into a well. That is human nature to rescue such a child. Zunzi, third century before the Common Era, lower left, also known as Sun Tzu, lived during a period of the Warring States, and he believed human nature was fundamentally evil. We need laws to keep people under control. It's a debate that goes on today. Three divisions of ethics. The study of ethics is usually divided into three major topics. Meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. We will define each one, although the lines between these topics are somewhat unclear. Meta-ethics literally beyond or above ethics. This is the study of the nature of ethical statements. Where do such statements come from and are they true or false? Normative ethics, this is the study of the ethical theories used to decide ethical questions. That'll be the, ma the majority of the rest of this module and all of the next module. These various theories include such theories as ethical subjectivism, cultural relativism, divine command theory, virtue ethics, natural law, ethical egoism, utilitarianism, deontology, feminine care ethics. We'll learn about all these. Applied ethics, this looks at the detailed ethical questions such as bioethics, 
business ethics, sexual ethics, animal rights, and environmental ethics. We can only touch on these issues, we'll not study them in detail in this class. Metaethics, the nature of ethical statements. Ethical realism. Ethical realism claims that the statement murder is wrong corresponds to something real in the universe. We've already discussed realism earlier in the class. We can give it a truth value, true or false, because it reflects something in Plato's world of the forms. Plato teaches that we have knowledge of the world of the forms because our soul comes from that perfect realm. We can learn to remember these forms. Ethical truths exist, and we can remember them. We can even reach to them with our minds. Another kind of ethical realism teaches that ethical statements are true or real because God said so. Ethical nominalism. We also studied nominalism earlier in the class. Perethics were not discovered but are simply human conventions. They have no spiritual reality, but were made by humans. Such ethical statements can be cognitive or non-cognitive. Cognitive is related to cognition or knowing. Cognitive ethical statements are statements with truth values, which we humans can know. Non-cognitive ethical statements have no truth values. We will say a bit more about this. Cognitive. It's a cute cartoon on the right you could look at. Cognitive statements have truth values that we can know. Here we need to introduce two more terms that will be vital throughout this course. Universal and relative. Universal ethics apply to all human beings everywhere throughout time. Such ethics may be based on science, utilitarianism, or reason, deontology. Relative ethics applies only to a particular culture or to nation or to particular people. The cartoon on the right reflects relative ethics. Non-cognitive. Non-cognitive statements claim that ethics are neither true nor false. They are mere feelings. Perhaps the leading figure in this approach to ethics was David Hume. We already learned his famous saying, you cannot learn an ought from an is. You cannot learn ethics from science. So what are ethics? According to Hume, they are mere feelings, or to use his term, sentiments. What's right or wrong, whatever feels right or wrong. Murder is wrong because I feel that murder is wrong. We now turn to the study of normative ethics or various ethical systems. Through the rest of this module, we will be studying relative ethics. In the next module, we will study universal ethics.